Welcome to the Movers Resource Guide podcast, connecting you to the resources you need to create success. We chat with the best vendors, associations, mentors, movers, and more, giving you the information you need to make your moving company the best it can be. I'm your host, Brian Hassan, CEO of Wayfinder Moving Services in Buffalo, New York, and president of the New York State Movers and Warehousemen's Association. Today, we have a special episode for you. It's Cashflow Crisis 101. Um, we had a lot of people looking at uh, our interview and conversation with Brock from Pro Mover Accounting. Got a lot of feedback that many movers are struggling right now. So we wanted to take it a step further. Uh, with Brock, we, we gave you kind of how to lower your, your overhead long term. And this is more of a cash flow crisis 101. How do we get you to spring? Um, what are some things you can do if you're struggling with cash that can get you from now until spring when when things open up a little bit more. So we have, you know, 10 to 12 tips, tricks, uh, ideas, source resources, things you can do to really help you with your cash flow that most movers may not know about. You might know about some, not about others, um, but we wanted to bring this to you so that you had some some help moving forward. Um, we know that movers are hurting right now, so uh, we, we just wanted to do our best to, to get out some of these guides and resources. So um, our guest today is Bryce Atkins, uh, founding partner of Move On in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Bryce has uh, graciously come on the show, was very vulnerable with us about his highs and lows and some of the struggles he's had and, and ways he's gotten through some of that. So really appreciate it appreciative of Bryce. Um, I really hope this helps some people out there kind of get through the next few months until we get to spring. Um, I, I hope it's helpful. Uh, so here, take a listen to this. All right, Bryce, welcome to the Movers Resource Guide podcast. I'm really happy to have you on today. Um, it's not necessarily like uh, an exciting, fun, energetic topic we have, uh, but it's something that people don't talk about often. And I'm really glad that you you uh, volunteered yourself to come lay on the stake here with me, uh, on these yeah. things. So welcome. Thank you. Happy to be doing this with you. <laughs> so I think it'll be fun. Um, yeah, <laughs> not a, yeah, not a fun I, topic, but we can try to have fun with it. No. And so, you know, cash flow crisis one one. how to, you know, it's, it's really, how do we get ourselves from the middle of February till spring when the money starts rolling in? Right. So, it's been a rough time for moving companies and and we know a lot of people are struggling financially and 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 some people are now and some people aren't now uh but if you're in business long enough you're gonna hit a point in time where you're probably gonna have a cash flow issue um so we kind of wanted to bring some of these great ideas uh, or not great ideas uh to the forefront <laughs> um and uh <laughs> ideas. at least discuss them so you know and we're not always in a cash flow struggle because we mismanaged our business. Sometimes timing was wrong. Things didn't go right. Um, sometimes it is because we mismanaged our business and we need to really look at our overhead and lower it and, and, and do a better job managing the, the cash in our business. But other times like, Hey, crazy circumstances come along, factors come in against you. And, you know, maybe we could have controlled it, but a lot of times those things we can't. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the first thing is, is nobody talks about their cash flow struggles, but also I think people are really embarrassed about it. And I think it's super helpful to have that conversation, to, to bring it out and say, Hey, yeah, I'm struggling. What's going on here. I need help. Uh, and I, I think that in the moving industry, that doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there's there's too much focus on uh well I think like most of the world we want to present uh good things and we want maybe some of us want validation or I think uh the industry has a bad reputation in a lot of ways. And so if you're able to be successful, I think people are, are rightfully proud of that, but I think they focus a lot on that. Um and it's I think it's the whole uh analogy of and I'm sure everybody's seen this, but it's it's like the mountain coming out of the water. It's just like, it looks pretty big coming out of the water, but when you yeah. zoom out, it's like way, way bigger deep down. And, yeah. uh, and I think that's really what it is. Like there's so much stuff that happens behind the scenes and there's so much stuff. I've joked around with a lot of people. Like 
if anybody that does not own a business ever owned a business, they would never use anybody ever. Because if they just knew how crazy the things were that they'd have to deal with on, you know, a consistent basis, I think that they would be shocked by yeah. even the, the, the companies with the greatest reputations. Um, some of the things that, that happen are just uh, wild because we're humans and we yeah. all got to deal with humans and we're in the service business. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, I think also maybe it's particularly helpful in the moving business to talk about these difficult things when things don't go perfect, because. I would say by over overwhelmingly, most people are in the moving business, do not have a, uh, like a formal business background. Yeah. Um, I know I don't. Um, yeah. And so I think it probably increases the amount of like, you know, incidental mistakes or learning opportunities that happen along throughout the years. Um, yeah. so I think it's I important to talk about this stuff that is very normal. I think it's normal. Yeah. And, and I will say, you say you don't have a business background. You've been through some crap. I've done a lot of dumb things. I have an MBA and <laughs> coming into like running a business with an MBA. Dude, and I'm like, I didn't know that. it's embarrassing how much I don't know. <laughs> um, so it, it's not, it, I, I always tell people like your education, when you go to run a small business is not really a factor. It's uh, you, you got to be willing to learn. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get to some, we're, we're going to lay out a bunch of tips and tricks of, or, or things you can do to, to help your cash flow. But before we get into those, you know, Bryce, we're, we're going to kind of change up the format here to kind of set up going into this and, and saying, Hey, sometimes just crazy stuff happens. You know, you have a fairly unique story of, of kind of what, what happened to you and how that affected your cash flow for a long time and, and put you into a, a bit of a, a tough spot. And I, I kind of want you to, to go through that story with us and um, your, your business partner, not business partner uh, situation that, that, that came up. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it all started back in. No, I'm just <laughs> um, so when I first got into the uh, moving business in 2014, um, it was just myself and a couple other guys. Um, and I, I kind of acquired a truck and a very small book of business. And by that, I mean, 150,000 a year in revenue, like a few moves a week. Yeah. Um, and I essentially bought what that was, the truck and the small book of business, I overpaid significantly because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, <laughs> I essentially paid a lot of money for a truck, I realized. Um, right. And a name, which I ended up changing the name later on. So, um, <laughs> uh, and I just made payments to the dude uh, weekly based upon whatever, you know, moves we had coming in. So it, I already feel like my way in, everybody's story is probably very unique about how they came into the moving business. Um, yeah. as is mine, but, uh, early on in 2015, I met an individual who I was introduced to from mutual friends and, um, and so far my experience of trying to interview movers at Starbucks, because I parked my truck outside of a extra space storage facility in like an oversized parking spot and paid <laughs> monthly rent for that. And I just worked out of my car. Um, so I met people at Starbucks, which was close to it. Um, my experience is, is that like out of 10 interviews, mm, two will show up. Yeah. And so it, I feel like it, it's very easy to be impressed sometimes by people. Um, and I was like, this guy has a degree, which um, I know, like you said, sometimes that's a, that doesn't always matter. Um, but he yeah. was very presentable, like very, he seemed very intelligent. He had a great personality and he seemed like he had a good head on his shoulders. And I was like, all right. I just kind of told them what my vision for the company was and what I wanted to do um, and kind of laid out like, no, right now I just need somebody to move, but yeah. it could progress towards, you know, eventually once we grow the team, I only need, needs, you know, a, an ops manager or a dispatcher at the mm -hmm. time. I didn't know the difference between a dispatcher and an ops manager. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, and it's like, you know, eventually grow with the company. And, uh, and so, that was the start of it. And, uh, the biggest lesson that I learned from this was not like not letting 
not becoming friends with people that work for you. And I don't mean that in like a cold way, but like I, I'm very friendly with a lot of people that work for me. I, I love everybody that works here. Yeah. But they, I didn't do a good job at like uh, separating the business. And I was like, hey, there's somebody that like is my age and we like some of the same things. And we're kind of, there's some camaraderie that was built up. And so essentially, yeah. uh, you know, a, a friendship and startups. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So a friendship yeah. was born out of that and it led to conversations and then some confusion on like who was responsible for what. And again, a, a lot of it was learning. Like I made some mistakes absolutely throughout this process, but ultimately when it ended up happening is, is that I felt like this person was not, uh, going to be a fit to be like a long-term big piece of the company. Yeah. And, and, and once and that I conversation that happened, lot. yeah. Yeah. Like guys come in, you're like, Oh, this is great. We're, we can do this and this with them. And then yeah, they, they tank down. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there was a lot of unique, you know, circumstances surrounding it. The fact that it was, we were still so small. I think that obviously played a much bigger role in, in everything. Um, but essentially, you know, there's a conversation of like, hey, there's there's not going to be the opportunity long term that we had talked about there possibly being because of, you know, this, this, this. And the uh, essentially what we what ended up happening was is that obviously he was upset. Um, mm -hmm. And I wasn't ending his employment. I was just like th these other these opportunities, I just, they just can't happen um, yeah. like we just possibly discussed them happening. And so it led to a lawsuit being filed uh, by him in 2017. And it led to, you know, it just was, we just settled it in last year, 2023, as far so, as like made the payments. So this um, is just an employee that you talked about maybe having a, a, a bigger role in the company, like an ops manager, even general manager, whatever it was, but a bigger role within the company, but still a job within the company. And so, you know, nobody's guaranteed anything. So what did he end up suing you for? Uh, so the mistake that I made was that I let conversations happen that in that moved beyond him possibly being just a general manager and like, could I have, could I be part owner or could I have some equity one day? And gotcha. instead of, and I didn't know how to navigate those conversations because it, this is my first time doing all this. So, yeah. um, I, I could say, well, it's not my fault, but it still ultimately is. And I learned a lot throughout the process. Mm -hmm. Um, and hopefully a lot of people can learn as well that if you say something in most <laughs> States, it's worse than having a contract because if you, d if you have a contract, you can counter sue, but in Tennessee, right. you cannot. So I had no opportunity to recoup any of my attorney's fees and legal fees. Um, and so like to be completely blunt, honest, like I can't discuss a lot of the details surrounding the settlement, yeah. but as far as just legal fees, like outside of the settlement over the course of six years, uh, it, it was close to half a million dollars. It's just wild. And on top of that, you had to pay a settlement, which we can't discuss, but right. just because you talked about potentially making somebody a partner or a part owner someday. And I, we would, I would think, well, that's hearsay. Where's the documentation to that? Yeah. And, and there was none and still they're able to try to come after you for part of your business. Um, yeah, there was just enough, it, there was enough conversations that were like one conversation over text, um, mm -hmm. a title that I let him have because, uh, he wanted to have some clout when he, if he was going to go into meetings, mm -hmm. um, and all these things I thought were harmless at the time because I was like, well, nothing's no decisions have been made. And so what's, what's the harm yeah. if it makes him happy and it makes him do his job really well, that's good. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I just learned, I learned a lot, but a half a million dollars <laughs> a over six years, like that's a massive hit to your cash flow. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, um, I think a big lesson that I learned in all this is I would, I, up until the last, like probably year and a half or especially two years, I have always been, uh, 
budgeting is for people that don't trust that they can sell more. <laughs> just something, you know, something ignorant like that. Like just something yeah. like, you know, the revenue or sales is the, it solves all problems. It's the answer to everything. And oh my goodness, does it help? I a thousand percent agree sure with that. Does. I mean, it's yeah. massive, but I, I definitely, my, my, I think I've been trying to mitigate a little bit of risk. And if I'm being honest, some of it has been a little bit too late for there not to be, you know, repercussions for mm -hmm. it. Um, especially when I look at some other, uh, guys that are in our same market that own moving companies, uh, and have been doing it longer, but are about the same size as I am right now, mm -hmm. but they've done it slower and a little bit more methodical and they've paid cash for trucks. I'm, it's hard sometimes not to look at that and be like, man, I'm really jealous because of these other investments that they're able to make. And they don't really seem like, you know, they have a whole lot of stresses about, uh, yeah. a lot of their debt because they were a little bit smarter early on about how they did it. And so again, like I wouldn't say regrets, but man, I would do a, quite a few things differently for sure. Yeah. And <clears throat> that's uh, the, the episode we had with, uh, Brock from ProMover Accounting kind of touches on that to go a little bit slower, keep your overhead down. And, right. and I'm, I'm living that now too, where, man, we, it, it was my, my friends, I have a couple of friends, um, besides you, believe it or not, I have my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you're my only friend, Brian, <laughs> uh, where, you know, they, they pick on me for, you know, my, I always, you know, like no matter what my problem is, like spending money or getting more sales is like my solution to that problem. So <laughs> yeah. I've been trying really hard to work on that. And, and so we do have that episode and, and I'm, I'm kind of, I'm trying to like pull back from that and be a little bit more conservative and say, okay, Hey, let's, let's slow down. Let's structure our overhead a little bit different. Um, I've, I've taken on a mentor to kind of, like I said, I have an MBA, right? I know how to read a financial statement. I have no problems with that, but you know, I, and hopefully I'll bring him onto the podcast in the future, but I have a friend that owns a moving company that uh, was an executive at Walmart. And just sitting down and going through a PL with him versus what I know is uh -huh. a mind bending experience. So, um, you know, these are things where it's like, hey, maybe we should slow down a little bit. Maybe sales isn't the only answer. Maybe there's some other solutions here. And I, I, I man, I, I feel you on that right now. Yeah, for sure. It, if, if I could like throw out like a, an, like, I guess an encouragement to people is that, I thought that, okay, so the, I'm going to my ninth year, like nine, nine to 10 years doing this. Um, and I have the worst resume ever. Nobody would hire me <laughs> if I didn't do this. <laughs> um, so I guess what I'm saying is, is that everything that I know, I essentially have learned most of it in the past nine years. Um, I thought that I w was good enough at reading financial statements um, and reading balance sheets and understanding that. And I would say that obviously compared to probably the general population I am, but I've really been challenging myself uh, recently on investing uh, in understanding it more. And, and so I'm actually about to take, uh, and anybody can apply for this, which is wild, but I'm about to take a Harvard business, a Harvard business school online course, uh, mm -hmm on understanding finances for like small business owners. And it's like a six week course and it's like $1,400. And oh, wow. I get that that's a good chunk of change. I'm not going to do it right now in February. <laughs> I'm going to do it a little later in the year. Uh, but, <laughs> but also uh, how kind of a, an empowering thing too, to say that, you know, you completed a, you get a certification from the Harvard business school online school. So um, yeah. yeah, like to just, to just learn and be open to learning is, and you don't have to learn everything on your own. It's, it's a lot of times a, a little bit of, of a cheat to listen to other people that have done it. Um, and I think that's a mistake that I made early on was I thought I had to pay my dues. I thought I had to like grind it out and figure everything out on my own. And I'm sure probably there's a reason for that. Maybe like therapy would tell me why I am that way, <laughs> but, uh, it, you don't have to, like, I think the smarter thing to do is to learn from other people, find people that are where you want to be and learn from them. Um, and that's been helpful being in the group with you and, and a lot of other people too. Yeah. Shout out to, uh, 
Tracy Beck and our uh, independent movers group through Starboard Collective, uh, our our CEO forum group, uh, 10, 10 moving companies in there where we get to to share financials and ideas and learn from each other. And mm-hmm. I, I, I'm sure that's helped. It, it's helped me and I'm sure it's helped you with oh, your yeah, financial knowledge and all that too. So, yep. um, all right, let's get to the meat and potatoes here, Bryce. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, so we have 10 to 12 things here that we're going to go through. Um, sure. And, and these ideas come from myself, Bryce, or other movers that we've tapped into and reached out to, to say, Hey, what's your, go to or what is something you've done in the past that uh has allowed you to you know cash flow yourself a little bit longer or when you're in a cash flow crisis what what is something you've been able to do in the past that has helped you so uh some for me some from Bryce, some from a bunch of other movers we have uh reached out to so i guess the first one i'll start with that's you know a, a little bit easier and is uh, so we we have offices in New York and Washington, and uh, both states have a what they call a shared work program. So with that shared work program, um, most of the time, if you p- cut somebody's hours back, they can't collect unemployment for that. They have to not work for you know the whole week, or have to have haven't worked for a couple weeks to be able to collect unemployment, but. Um, Both New York State and the state of Washington have programs where instead of laying one employee off, you can lay partially lay off five employees. So you could cut their work back by 10, 20, 30 percent for the week. So um, and they can then go and collect like let's say you cut their hours back by 20 percent. You would then be able to pay them four days a week under your payroll and then the state will pay them unemployment for one day a week. So they haven't lost their job. Their hours are just cut back, but they're still able to collect unemployment benefits, um, which can save you 20% on your payroll. Um, if let's say if you were to, to do that. So um, Brian, would you use this for movers and drivers like hourly employees only, or would you, or what employees uh, would you use that on? It's a really interesting question. So at Wayfinder, we are actually using it this winter. Um, and we are using it for only our office staff here. Okay. Um, and you can do it. That, by that class was my of first employee. thought. That was my yeah, first you thought, can yeah. use it by class of employee. Um, conversely, at Apex, we're using it for our field employees only. Um, just the way the companies are structured and what's going on and everything that just happens to be how it works out. But uh, you could do it either way. Um, so it's a way for you to reduce your payroll costs by cutting hours a little bit but it doesn't hurt your employees as much as it would otherwise. And if there's people you just don't want to lay off, you don't want to lose them. Here's kind of like this middle ground where it hurts everybody a little bit, but it helps overall. Um, And so you could save a certain percentage of your payroll every week. And that's the biggest expense we have and all moving companies have is their, their payroll. So uh, that's, that's one idea that uh, we actually use and is, is helpful. So, uh, we want to give consequences for each one of these things that we bring out. So the consequence is, you know, it does affect your workers' comp rates, you know, uh, theoretically over time if if you use this too often or have too many people who uh, would be on an on employment, um, that would, you know, it could affect your, your workers' comp or, sorry, your unemployment insurance rates. Um, so that, that's one. All right. Bryce, what do you got for us? All right. I think it makes sense to go with the low hanging fruit, the easier ones to have the <laughs> lowest consequences, I guess. Um, yeah. So uh, I think the, the obvious, probably the one that most people would think of is, is asking vendors and I'll even just include uh, any loans for truck payments or truck leases as a, as a part of the vendor like list um, mm-hmm. to ask them for deferred payments. Um, obviously, I think that if you have a lease, I believe in the past it's added, it's extended the the term of the lease. We've had to essentially kind of uh, do an amendment to the lease, if you will, Mm -hmm. for any deferred payments. And we have to add those months on at the back end. Um, And you've been able to do that with like a truck you're leasing? Yeah, I think the most we were able to do was three months. And we did that during COVID. Um, Okay. uh, 
And then for our actual, like, l- the, the issue with that is, is that some of them won't extend it to the, to the back of the term on a few of them. We, they, de- when they deferred the, whatever the amount was deferred was due all at a certain point. So if we deferred it by three months, all three months were due in three months. Oh, and so obviously so that's see. not nearly as helpful. Uh, yes. So, uh, so make sure that there's like, you know, <laughs> You got to be careful with that one too, because there's a chunk that you might owe. Um, so, uh, truck payments uh, deferral, well, and, and let me say on yeah. that the the truck payments too. So, um, w- we've been through this before with with the truck payments where we were we were slow, and some of the not main vendors will give you a really hard time. We had a vendor tell us one time that they would defer our payments for two months if we paid three months payments up front. <laughs> It was like this weird, I was like, gee, that's not helpful at all. Thanks. Uh, But, um, and I've talked to a couple of people uh, reference this one too. So specifically for sure, BMO and Daimler will allow you to defer your truck payments for two to three months. And and the only penalty per se on that is that you're, you're still accumulating interest on that. Um, so you right. pay a little bit more interest long term, right. but they just tuck those payments um, for vehicles you own at the if, at the end of that loan. It's pretty easy to do. They're pretty open about it. They're they have this issue with with companies all the time. So sure, they'll let you defer two to three months payments every twelve months. Um, and so a, a number of people have mentioned that one. That that's that's kind of a an easy go to for them. Um, but if whoever your truck vendor is, just ask. If you're struggling with cash flow, just call them yeah. and ask. And they're 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 not going to shut you down or give you a problem over it. And I remember we did it one winter. They gave us the deferment, and then that spring we bought a new truck through them, and they still approved it. So they don't yeah. even hold it against you long term. Yeah, and the one caveat that I would say is that the only time that I think you're going to have an issue is if you're already late if you already are past due like you have to make sure you get ahead of these things like overly communicating and jumping ahead because they're not going if you're late three months they're not going to defer those three months for you no uh no when we experienced it we made we had to be current that was uh that was a requirement um and then the i guess just to kind of piggyback off of that just vendor uh deferrals in general so i would say probably for us some of our bigger vendor Vendors right now would be, uh, we have like a fuel tank on site with diesel. Um, and we do a lot of packing. So we get a lot of packing materials, boxes, and probably more equipment than what I wish because sometimes <laughs> just blankets end up missing. Um, it's just really frustrating. That's a whole nother. We'll, we'll episode, do a podcast though. in the future. Yeah, that's a whole nother episode. And keeping control of your equipment. Um, there you go. <laughs> uh, but uh, we have a great relationship with, uh, and we're lucky to have a company that's local, that's based, that they have like three other locations. Um, and so we have a great relationship with them. And what we, we actually, kind of what we ended up doing when it came to the vendor referrals for them, uh, for the, de- excuse me, for the vendor deferral payments for them, we essentially are kind of doing the same thing we did when we initially asked for the deferral, which was just making smaller payments on a more consistent basis. Yeah. Um, and that's something that our, uh, accounting company kind of did when it came to like, if we were putting a lot of our monthly payments on Amex, like if we have a massive balance, so that way we can pay it off every month and not have to pay the interest mm-hmm. instead of getting $90,000, <laughs> you know, like we have to pay a $90,000 payment at on the seventh, then we're just paying, you know, 10,000, 15,000 a week. And so that's what yeah. we basically did with, uh, some of those other uh, vendors were making smaller payments more consistently. Yeah. And I, I, w- I think that y- you may or may not have trouble with your mechanic, depending on your relationship with them, but your, your vendors in the industry, such as your packaging supplier or whatever else, like they're used to this. They know they, I'm not saying they like it necessarily. And they, they were the, they were the most it. understanding of any vendor, but, but they're going to be understanding yeah. because a lot of people go through it. And if you've been a good customer and you know, if you're paying, late in the summer, it might not be as easy to work with them. But you know, if you've been a typically good customer, you know, instead of paying it late or letting that that bill 
get really high with them to the mm-hmm. point where they're threatening not to deliver cartons to you. Sure. Just pick up the phone and call them is what you're saying and say, Hey, I can't pay that $5,000 this week, but I can, I, I could give you a thousand dollars a week or right. whatever that number is until we get to a more comfortable place. Yep. But I, I think they're pretty understanding. And as long as you give them something, they'll continue to work with you. Yeah, I agree. Um, and so, uh, yeah, vendor deferral payments, uh, that's, I think, an easy one to, to tackle, um, especially because it's usually with people you already have relationships with. So I think it's, I think it's a, it's a lot, people are a lot more understanding. Um, what else you got for low hanging fruit, <laughs> easy ones? So, uh, Even though, fruit, I, <laughs> let's be honest, all of these are shit. <laughs> well, if compared you're, if you're to in... compared to you know lots of profit and money rolling in and yeah and and, and a perfect ran business but <laughs> and, and not to pick on a friend who who gave us a, a advice because she's awesome and I'm somewhat jealous of her because uh, she runs her business I'll leave her name out of it I already know who you're talking about because she makes me mad <laughs> she... too because she her <laughs> business is really well run yeah yeah so she's <laughs> she's not in a cash flow crunch and so when we asked no. it was uh well hey uh used your line of credit that you already have established. Yeah. Oh yeah. That maxed out, you know, what idea. are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what are you going to do when your line of credit's maxed out? So, um, it, it, run your business better, I guess. I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> um, so this kind of ties some other things together. It goes back to communication again, but, um, the same stuff with, and, and the reason we first use that truck payment deferral is I grew up really poor, right? We had no money growing up, uh, you know, well below the poverty line. Uh, you know, I had to, I had three jobs at 14, right? Cause if I wanted something, I had to work. And, um, one thing I learned from my mom was, you know, for a mortgage payment or a car payment, you know, cause she used to work with the bank at, at a bank as a teller, um, she said, man, if you just call the company and just talk to them, they'll actually be willing to defer your payments. So those things we talked about with your truck payments, if you need to take less money yourself or you're not able to pay yourself because there's not enough money in the company to pay yourself, proactively go to your mortgage lender, go to your whoever has your car payment and just see what they're willing to do to work with you. So um, I, I I don't know if well, I think it's a good use that one, but it's surprising what a conversation can do. I have, and I think that's a great point to bring up. And I, I don't think it's just uh, relevant to small companies. Uh, we did that with Amex. We did that with our, our business American Express account is that we were like, we're not going to be able to pay the whole amount that's due. Yeah. Um, but we also can't get these cards shut off because we use so much of, you know, of it for like out of town stuff because we have expense cards for guys getting hotels or they need to get fuel. Um, and so the, the first thing they said was thanks so much for calling us. It actually makes a big difference when you call us and let us know. And, and so it's like, wow, it's kind of surprising. So it works for big companies too. Yeah. Not just small local places. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think, it, and, and, and this comes back to a lot of these do, and especially this next one too, is I, I think when I was younger and I made a lot of dumb choices and finances were tough, I was afraid to have the conversations. I didn't want to tell the banker that I was struggling financially because mm. it's a slow season because yeah. well, I don't want him to shut down my line of credit. I don't want him to just start siphoning money out of my bank account. I don't want people to do this or that. And there was so much fear surrounded a, a, around what they could do to me if they thought I was struggling. Sure. And uh, what really happened is then they just don't know anything and then they're pissed. But sure. if, yeah. if you just have that conversation with them, they're like, oh, well, you've been great so far. Let's see what we can do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think that in the times where we've been struggling, that is, you know, those conversations have been super helpful. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, we didn't own a building, went to a landlord and said, Hey, we've been a good tenant for a number of years. We can't afford, uh, you know, it's just really slow this season for whatever reason. Um, can we defer a couple months rent and just tack them on to the rest of the year? 
because with a with a lease you're never gonna it, it's not like you own the truck and there's an end payoff date at the end right right where you could just extend those payments well it depends on your lease month. but usually yes yeah <laughs> but like if it's a warehouse lease let's say yeah you yeah know, absolutely like the so so they have to tack it on but in the summer you could afford to pay a little bit more and catch back up Mm -hmm. um and if you've been a good tenant um and we were surprised and landlord was at that time was like yeah no problem you know you've been a good tenant like i know you're good for it i i can see that it's slow we you know the reasoning why it was slow was was acceptable and um so yeah uh shocked when we had that conversation that they were that willing to play ball um but once again you had a a good consistent payments up to a certain point in time. And then they were really able to work with you a little bit more. Um, so I, there, there's a, a lot of these are going to have that communication theme. <laughs> in there, Right. Right. Yeah. Very um, much so. All right. What's your next one? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my next one is, is actually instead of, it's more of a, something internally that you can do and you don't have to go outside for it. So it would be to increase your deposits on uh, all moves, but especially uh, long distance over the road moves. Um, that's something that we've done. Uh, I know you and I talked kind of briefly off air that the amount that we take for deposits is already high and kind of rare. <laughs> but I think the the thing to learn about this is that we take a 50% deposit for any long distance move. Um, Which to well, me is like, I don't take any deposit for a long distance move. Yeah, we, I know we were, I know we were harping <laughs> you on that. <laughs> we were all ragging on you a little bit. Um, and so actually what we've done is that uh, we basically just kind of made the sales team aware of the cash flow issue and said, if you have like fill out the client, if you feel like that they're going to be interested maybe in, paying a little bit less if they want to pay more up front, um, then let's have that conversation with them. And it's, I think we've probably had already 10 moves where we've gotten a hundred percent of the move fee paid as a deposit because we gave wow. them, because we were honest and we said, Hey, we're a service business. It's slow this time of year. The reason we're offering, this sounds shady. We know. And the re but the reason we're offering this is because we have cash flow issues in the in the winter, but because you're willing to pay a much bigger deposit, then we'll, you know, take the move of the 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 cost of the move down this much, either a percentage or or a dollar amount off. Yeah. Um. And the sales team's done a great job, and so, uh, it's helped a lot, and yeah. helped a lot in January this year. Which, you know, in a perfect world, you don't have to do that, and you can keep it all right and not have to give that discount. But if you're trying to make sure, sure that you're paying for the fuel or making that truck payment or, or whatever it is, uh, making sure you're making payroll through winter and a tough cash flow time, that could be a huge help. And yeah. And I, I think, uh, I think bringing your sales team into that too. So that way they kind of are a part of it. I think it's important to make sure that your team is aware about this stuff. Um, yeah. not, not to the point where they are worried they're not going to get paid, obviously. You know, like you, you <laughs> I mean, we, I want to be transparent and honest, but I also don't want to, them to lose trust or faith in what we're doing. Um, because I'm willing to do all of these crazy ideas in order to make sure that they always get paid, <laughs> you know, um, that's why we're having this conversation because like, yeah. no matter what, they're going to get paid. That, yeah. That's never going to not be, uh, I, just how much interest we'll have to pay in order for them to get paid, you know, <laughs> I, Dude, this is, it's so funny because like, I'll have like, I've had these conversations over the years with my team. It's like, Hey, this winter is going to be really tough on cash flow, or, Hey, we already know our reserves are depleted this much. We really have to lean out, cut down over this winter, uh, cash flow, whatever. And then I get five people that come up to me and it's like, am I losing my job? And I was like, I, I didn't say we're laying people off. I just said, cash flow is going to be tight. And yeah. I, I can't walk that line between everybody thinking it's doomsday and us just needing to make sure we're very, very diligent about uh, what we're spending. I get so, it. Yeah. I, I, my best salesperson who is, I mean, money hungry, which is why he's the best salesperson. Um, mm -hmm. He's like, uh, and, uh, what, you're really worrying me when you say stuff like that. And I'm like, no, I'm just, I feel like it's, you know, we run a very like transparent 
honest business. And I just want you to know. And he's like, uh, all right, well, don't tell me that. <laughs> he's like, just let me, just let me sell. And I'm like, that's fair. You know, okay. yeah, I won't everybody, you everybody works different. I just won't tell you, uh, yeah. but I do need you to get the whole cost of the move paid in the deposit. <laughs> if you um, want to get paid next week, I'm just kidding. And, and, and to be honest, so that scares me a little bit because I'm like, okay, I, I got the whole deposit and I paid payroll this week. How am I going to pay for the fuel for the guy to get there and the labor next week if I'm still short? So, um, I, it, Hey, if it gets you to next week and that's the only way, like, it is what it is. You'll figure I mean, it next week out next week, right? If that's where you're at. Kind of, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, so for us, since we don't collect any deposit on any moves whatsoever, you know, could we start collecting a deposit on local bookings? Could we start collecting a deposit on uh, interstate moves? And I think a lot of people don't take deposits on interstate moves. So, you know, maybe that's something they could do. If they're not doing it yeah. at all. And that I thought you were, I thought you were saying, could you? And I was like, no, should the answer, the question is, should you? And the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so I, I like that one. And that one's uh that's a new good one for me to, to put in my uh, tool belt here. Uh, if I were I, can I add one small thing to the like increasing yeah. deposits? One thing that we've done in the past, I understand everybody drops their rates in the winter. We do too. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but sometimes we've gone too far and we've removed like a fuel surcharge or we've removed like a travel fee or like a service fee and we didn't need to, but we were scared that if we didn't, we weren't going to book people. And I think all it did was hurt us when it came to some of our margins. Um, right. and so we've been conscious not to do that this past winter. And I don't think it's made a difference. Um, obviously we'll lower our rates, but some of those small things like it, uh, yeah, 50 bucks on a move for a fuel surcharge. If you charge for something like that, that makes a big difference over the course of a month for a little stuff like that, that people it, aren't really going to, I don't think, does. argue about. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. And we typically, you know, raise our rates in the spring and then never drop them. Um, you know, if we feel like we need to be a more competitive on something, you know, we're regulated in New York State. So there's certain things we, we yeah. might just... Yuck. lower it and bind it so that yeah. it's a binding quote if we feel like we need to be more competitive. But um, I, when I get into these situations or ever, whenever we raise our prices, I, I, I key into the salespeople and, hey, are you losing this because of price? Yes. Okay. If we were $10 an hour per guy cheaper or $10 an hour cheaper, would you have still lost it because of price? Yes. Okay, well, I wasn't going lower than that anyway, or whatever that number is. And I think I'd have a real time lowering my prices, like, altogether, until I was hearing regularly from salespeople that we were losing a certain amount of work from that. But I, mm -hmm. I would never do it proactively just in case. So, yeah. I think, you, um, I think you might be in the minority, though, which I, that's why I brought it up. Because I know yeah. that it, we're like, oh, well... What gets you in trouble is being reactive. Let's be proactive as a business. <laughs> so we're going to proactively lower the rates a little bit. Um, and yeah. I and I think that that I think a lot of times that's a mistake. So that's what I, I just I, uh, I, and that's great that you guys haven't done it. Yeah. I have. I've made that mistake. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so um, okay, we're we're going super long here, but I want to get make sure we get all these in. Well, you're talking um, so dang much, dude. I mean, I let's know, go. Right. Come on, just tell me. The <laughs> So uh, another thing that was recommended to us was um, I, I've seen these offers come to me all the time where, you know, like Best Egg or Lending Club, you know, it's like, hey, get a $30,000 personal loan or a $40,000 personal loan or whatever else. And, um, you, you know, so you, you want me to speak on this one since, since I've done it? Because <laughs> you've done it. <laughs> um, <laughs> since so, I've yeah, done sure, it this ahead. winter. <laughs> uh yeah, oddly enough, um, the I've used Lending Club. I've probably done five to seven personal loans through them. Okay. Um, some of them were actual personal loans, like a long time ago. And the most recent ones have been personal loans just to have funds for the business. Mm -hmm. um, and man, it's a, it's a lot lower interest rate than than factoring or the credit card processing loans, uh, which we haven't discussed those yet. Cause I think they're worse options 
than yeah. some of the other ones we've we've spoken on. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, it did take a while, uh, and I'm sure you've probably experienced this too. But it took a while to build up the business's credit um, to where I didn't have to be a personal guarantor for everything. Um, yeah. And so I think the 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 hardest thing is is that if you're still so small that you have to sign as a personal guarantor for everything, it's going to be hard to get a, a even an okay. Uh, a personal loan through lending club, because again, like your personal credit is going to be the biggest fact. It's going to be the factor that they're taking into account. Yeah, so if sure. your utilization is crazy high or luckily Amex doesn't count, it gets light utilization because you're supposed to pay it off every month. So, right. no, I mean, uh, I, I, so like, and, that's what I mean. It's, it's, it, it did, it has helped pay for a few weeks of payroll and I had, and I did do it as like an emergency because again, I wanted to be proactive and our, uh, <laughs> our line of, our line of credit is maxed out at our bank for the business. <laughs> so I can't do it like uh, our friend that runs an impeccable company, uh, uh right. Books wise. Right. So, so yeah, I, <laughs> um, I have had to do it. And I believe the interest rate was around 14%, which is not great, but man, no. it's a lot better than some of these really bad options. Yeah. And in the friend that I talked to that did it, um, recently it, there was a loan origination fee, but they were able to get yep. 30, 40 grand within a week or so um, deposited into their account. Um, and it came with like three year payment terms at 15 to 18%. Um, and, but there was like a thousand dollar, $1,200 loan origination fee. So it's super yep. costly still to do it. I got 40 grand, $1,200 origination fee and three year payment terms at 14%. Yeah. So super costly, but if it gets you through payroll and gets you to summer, great. Like it's better than going out of business now or not being able to make payroll now. Right. So I, I yeah. think that's, and, and I say it in that specific way because I think there's a lot of moving companies hurting right now and a lot of people at risk of going out of business. Now, once again, I'll, I'll say again, but the backside of this is get through your payroll issues now, but lower your friggin' overhead so that you can survive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> don't like in, in all reality, don't, don't make, don't make the same mistakes every year, every winter. And I have that it's something that I have. And some of that again is from legal fees, um, haunting and like putting me, you know, me way behind. Um, but some of that has also been just being a little too aggressive with, with financing growth. And I think that that's a mistake. And I, I thought that it was a good idea because it worked for us. Um, yeah. But for, until it doesn't, until it doesn't uh, yeah. financing assets. Sure. Financing revenue. Mm, that's that, that hasn't worked out well for us. Um, yeah. And again, like I'm, I'm still kind of paying for some of the consequences of some of those decisions. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, if I ever, if I ever uh, run an, if I ever start over uh, in a different city or like start at something different, oh goodness, uh, I don't. Yeah, so many mistakes would not be made, or so many decisions would not be made that were made. So, so <laughs> one of the other things we had here was like, is the is the best egg and lending club thing the same type of thing as like cabbage or the Amex loans, or is that like a whole different lane? Uh, in my experience is different. Lending club was personal. So, okay. um, it, so then, I guess obviously it depends does, on how uh, your business is set up. Uh, and, and I don't want to get like too far down, like a rabbit hole with that, but I am paid me and my business partner are paid a salary because we have, we are a C corporation cause we have some investors mm-hmm. that own some shares. Um, so I just always put down that I'm employed anytime I do anything. Cause I am employed yeah. by, I just so happen to own, uh, yeah some equity in the company as well. So, um, so that, that's completely personal. The credit card processing loans, I believe there's two different types and I haven't been able to take advantage of one. We have another mutual friend that, that did, that has done, uh, directly through Amex. And I don't remember how he did it directly through Amex because he was able to have access to a, like, it was a good amount of money, a few hundred grand. I I was kind of shocked. Um, okay. But the, again, like, payments automatically come out every month. And I believe it goes based upon the amount of Amex uh, credit card transactions that you run. So you have to actually like log into your 
um, credit card processor and you have to see how much Amex you actually run because they don't care about the other credit cards. They're like, do you get a lot of people that pay with Amex? It's, it's like a weird thing. Um, the one that I've done is based upon uh, it was Amex teamed up with Cabbage and it was directly okay. through the business. And essentially they took into account your payment history, what your like monthly, um, what your monthly charges were on Amex. And if you pay it on time and they figured out some sort of random number and we got 50 grand through that. And then, so what do they do in that case? They just, do they take it directly from the credit card processor before it even gets to you or do they? No, that's pull actually pulled out. Of, it's pulled out of the bank account. Cause we have to connect okay. obviously a bank account for payments. Um, so it's pulled, it's taken directly out of the bank account. And if I remember right, the payments uh, are about 2,500 a month. And uh, was that like, was it a super high interest rate or how, how did that work? It was, it was ugly. So this uh, is not one we want to do. Right? Yeah, <laughs> the only higher interest rate than this one is factory. Okay. That's like, which I've also done. <laughs> right. so I'm not just... proud of these things, but I, <laughs> but I'm, but I'm willing to, to admit, I'm willing to admit to them for sure. And, and here's hopefully and, to spare so other I, people from maybe getting in the and, same and, position. And, and that's the thing. And I appreciate your vulnerability on this. And, you know, obviously we've had to do some of these things, some of the more difficult ones, like you've been able to do, I think I've looked at it factoring or some of these other stuff in the, in the past, or there's some predatory lenders out there that'll, oh yeah, we'll give you business funding in 24 hours. And, um, it, uh -huh. the, if you do the annualized APR on it, it's like 50, 60, 70%. And, and, I've looked into those things, not knowing how bad it would be. And I've told the people on the phone, like the only way I will ever loan money from you is if I know I'm going out of business already and you're never going to get your money back <laughs> because like, yeah. I'm not going to pay a hundred percent APR to right. borrow money from you. Like I'm going to put myself out of business if I do that. Yeah. So, um, uh, but okay. So, so they're like, you went through cabbage, you said, so, so uh, I mean, it was technically through, it was technically through Amex. I logged in with Amex. But it was okay. a it was some sort of partnership that they had done with Cabbage, and I th a lot of people are probably familiar with Cabbage just from getting mailers from them uh, yeah. about like business funding. Now their interest rates are bonkers usually, but it was a little bit more favorable because it was through Amex and because there was some sort of established like relationship there. Um, but but credit card processing loans are an option, especially if you run a lot of credit cards. It's not a good option. It's going to cost you a ton of money. Once again, this is like. These are, I can't make payroll next week and I don't know how I'm going to, and I have no other options left type of things, right? Uh, I would say, yeah, I would say yes um, on on the credit card processing. Now, I don't remember the turnaround from how long it took to fund, but it was pretty quick. It's pretty quick. I it wasn't as fast as Lending Club. Nothing's faster than Lending Club. Okay. It's usually three days for me. So for Lending Club. I mean, like, it's, like it was like emergency... If, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but if you already so, have a lending club loan out for an emergency and you need another emergency loan, then credit card processing loans might be for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, um, so here's another good one I got that I, I really like this one a little bit better because I think the interest rate potentially could be lower. And I looked into it because I didn't believe it and I wanted to make sure. But uh, somebody said that Richie Brothers has a funding arm, which is true. They, they have, uh, so if you were to buy uh, trucks from auction a lot, they would give you a line of credit to buy vehicles from Richie Brothers Auctions. But uh, a, a friend of mine told me that they would loan you money against a truck you already own. And no banks do that because I've tried. Like, hey, the engine blew on this truck. I really don't have the cash, but I want to get it rebuilt. I don't mind, you know, getting a twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 loan on that truck, rebuild the engine and, and get it back running quick again. Um, and I, I, I wish I had that option. Sometimes I don't ever want the truck payment back once I've paid it off. Um, All right. but anyways, he said that Richie brothers would loan you uh, money on a truck that you already own. And so I, I filled out a form and, and requested information. Um, and uh, I, I haven't like, I didn't pursue the process further just enough to find out that it is true. And I do have a truck that might need an engine and I might go through this process. Um, but I, I thought it, that was a good did one. Did DEF because, get in the fuel tank? Uh, 
no, not on this one. Oh. I've had that happen before. Same. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, and I haven't checked the interest rate or anything, but I imagine it's going to be in that eight to 12% range, eight to 10%. Um, if they were to offer you that, which is a lot better than maybe a lending club or. or well, let's also keep in mind too, or, that we're, we're in a time where uh, interest rates are seven to 8%. Like that's correct. That's what the federal interest rate is. So, so does if something's between eight and twelve, that's pretty. (laughs) I mean, you can't get a whole lot. Yeah, but it's true. You can't get a whole lot better than that. But we're also I'm comparing it sometimes to oh, I remember when I got an SBA loan for three and a half (laughs) percent on a ten year term. You know, so correct. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I'm definitely keeping that Richie Brothers one in my back pocket uh, in the future. If hopefully I don't need it, but if I were to, yeah. Um. Another quick one we, before we get to the last and worst option. Um, another quick one would be if you are a part of a van line, you can't take those deposits on those uh, interstate moves. But um, you, a lot of van lines will work with you, or I, the ones I've been with in the past have, uh, you know, they, they'll give you a little advance on maybe work you've done that's sitting out there or work that's booked and scheduled, but maybe you haven't run it yet. Sometimes they'll give you advances on on some of that anticipated work to help you out. Um, depends on your relationship with the van line, maybe how important you are to them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and what their overall philosophy is, but, but that might be an option for some people is to just reach out to the van line, see what they can do to help you out. So uh, the last one, and this is probably going to be our longest podcast we've had, but uh, <clears throat> tell us about factoring. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's a bad really, idea it's really shitty uh <laughs> <laughs> it sucks a lot so i factoring in my experience uh, i've done it twice um the first time was through just like a generic factoring company that i was told about by someone and it was uh, kind of the classic way of factoring from what I understand, which is they basically purchase uh, an, an AR, you know, an accounts receivable from you mm-hmm. for a fraction of what it is. So that way you can have the money right then right. and there. Um, yeah. And I mean, if you don't do any commercial work, if you don't do any work on net 30 terms or net 60 terms, hopefully nobody does anything on net 60 terms. Um <laughs> Uh, but like, for instance, we might work with some restoration companies where we do have net 30 terms because they're getting paid from insurance for a lot of stuff. Um, and so they don't get paid right away. And so we have to wait a little bit. Um, the great thing is, is you can charge crazy amount of margins on that stuff, but it also means you got to wait. Um, and so when we've done factoring, it's the first time was they purchased a large invoice basically, and they gave us they bought it for 80% of what the value of the invoice was. Um, So essentially what that means is if an invoice was $10,000, they gave us $8,000 right up front. And again, these aren't the exact terms. I don't remember what it is, but 80% is very common. Um, And then whenever the invoice was paid, they had the rights to it. The check went straight to them. Yeah. Um, and then and so the second way I've done factoring, yeah, run go ahead. credit with your with your vendor potentially and stuff. Yeah, like that. I definitely had to put some yeah some uh, some references on there for them to check. Um, and then the second way, which has been uh, a, a little bit better, was we actually know somebody who started a factoring company, um, and he we were able to bulk like some. Uh, it weren't it, there weren't even invoices, which this is I, I think. I don't know if it's relevant for a lot of people, but it is rare if you can find it. But it was more so he was actually paying us on on work that we had deposits on so that we haven't even serviced yet. But if we had a deposit on something, like if we had a 50% deposit, he would he was paying us the other 50% for like a, a long distance move for like the whole month of January. Wow. Um, and we had better terms with that. It wasn't like they bought the invoices from us. It was... We're going to give you, we know that you have this much work coming. Um, it's definitely not as much, it, you know, it wasn't 80%. It was this much amount for these, for these invoices. And, you know, 
it's due in July. Yeah. Which is a much better time to have to pay stuff. <clears throat> uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, Hopefully nobody has to really learn too much about factoring. Uh, I don't know everything about it. Thank goodness. Um, I think I tried to forget the last time that I tried to do it. It was, uh, I definitely w wanted to forget about that experience, but yeah, yeah. but that, I was that, able to pay payroll and I was able to make sure that, you know, 15 people that worked for me at the time years ago when I did this were able to get paid and they still had faith in the company and their families were able to get groceries and, it was worth it. Yeah. So, and, and I think that's when it comes down to some of these things, nobody wants to be in the position to have to go to somebody for factoring or whatever else. But right. if, if the option is like, if you're not going to make payroll this week, you're out of business because your mm -hmm. employees aren't going to, you might get a couple that hang around for the second week to find out if you can make it the next time, but you're pretty much at a point then where you're out of business. So yep. if you're out of business and you, you can't service work, you can't fight for it anymore. You, you, yeah. You're done. Like you can't, like there's nothing left to fight for. But mm -hmm. if you can keep making payroll and find solutions, you live to fight another day. We know in this industry, you can make more money in the summer. And, you know, but that's the, and that's the time where you can kind of get back on even footing. And I think that sometimes my mistakes in the past are I got to summer and then pretended like I didn't have problems last winter. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and we still try to yeah, grow this winter. And, and we're going to have revenue is going to be higher sales team stronger. Yeah. Our, like yeah. Positive outlook. Yeah. And, and so, and yeah, didn't makes it a little bit I, too I aggressive. I didn't really dial back. And I think that's over the last year or so, that's the lesson I've really learned is like, no, no. What if it doesn't get better? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what if it is bad? Maybe, maybe we should have more of a reserve. Maybe we shouldn't buy that truck. Maybe we shouldn't hire that extra. Uh, office person to help us answer phones this summer. Um, maybe we should just save that money and be a little more stressed out or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I mean, well, if you're really stressed out, like, is there a max? You know what I mean? Like, if it doesn't, <laughs> is there like a is there a buffer? Like, if you're 100 percent maxed out, you can't be 101, right? That's the that's most. Right. So, like, what does it yeah. matter? <laughs> just yeah, just, <laughs> just keep piling it on. <laughs> uh, yeah. And and why pay somebody else to answer phones for work? You're just going to turn down because you're overbooked anyway. Right. Just right. Don't answer the phone. I, and I'm being a little <laughs> facetious with some of this, yeah, but, for sure. um, you know, I, I think it, it, we're not necessarily condoning you do all of these things. I I've done some of them. Bryce has done a lot of them. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a good thing to be doing them all the time. Right. But I, I wanted to give some resources to people to help them fight through the rest of this winter so that they could, make it to spring so they had the ability to continue on with their business that's why we wanted to do this and and bryce i i so much appreciate your candor and your your vulnerability and willing to talk about this and i i guarantee you it's going to help some people i i hope that i, I certainly hope that it does um yeah. i've gotten some ideas out of here you know this winter and, and last winter were both rough winners for us um last winter was saying. rough but we had enough reserves to get through but then summer wasn't what we thought it was going to be. And now this winter is also rough. And so it's, you know, we have to get a little bit more creative and uh, you know, it's, it's not a fun time to be a moving company owner for a lot of people. Um, so I, I, I really hope it helps. Um, and, and I couldn't have done this episode without you. So <laughs> I, I, I greatly uh, appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I think actually people. a lot of these, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The, well, and it's embarrassing, right? Like nobody wants to sit here and say, yeah, I didn't manage my business well enough or, or things didn't go right. And now I'm having to make these really crappy choices. And the problem is, is people don't talk about it. So people don't know what their options are. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, and, and I'm sure if people are having trouble and they want to talk to somebody about it, I'm, I'm open to having a conversation. Yeah, so absolutely. Sure same. Too. Um, yeah. And, and be, you know, this, this actually, even though it wasn't a fun topic, I did enjoy chatting about this with you. Um, there were a couple things that I haven't used yet, so hopefully I won't have to. <laughs> um, but yeah, as far as, you know, being honest and, and transparent, uh, for better or worse, it's the only way I know how to be. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, often um, in our group emails, I'm saying, Hey Bryce, tell us how you really feel. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty obvious. It's always <laughs> obvious. Um, but I, I think uh, I, I hope at least that some of this stuff is helpful because uh, what I can promise you're not going to get from me is me posting pictures of um, like a Rolex with my hand on, uh, you know, a ra- you know, uh, a G wagon or nothing against people to drive G wagons is cool, but I'm just saying like, I'm not, you're not going to see me posting about with the, you know, like, like a Lamborghini with my Rolex on the uh, steering wheel because I can't afford one. Cause I made all these bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah, not, not to knock on people that do that, but that's not my thing. I, I mean, maybe we, I don't know. Maybe and maybe it's because I can't afford it. That that's why it's not for me. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> um, you no. Know? Well, maybe listen, I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are uh, so far over. We're pretty much a double podcast here, but uh, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I, I, I know you're a busy guy. Um, well, you should not have brought an expert on on debt if you didn't <laughs> want to have a long podcast. About it. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. So, no, yeah, I um, know that it, we got to wrap it up, but uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it's. Here great for the you know the the three other people that listen i'm just kidding i'm sure you know how i'm sure you have a much bigger base than that yeah well two of them are me you know (laughs) uh that's good um all right buddy well Well, i'm looking forward to seeing you too when you come up and you rip my business apart in april so Uh, maybe you can help me prevent from making some of these mistakes in the future i will i will do my best all right (laughs) sweet all right have a good one all right man good see you All right. Thank you for listening, everybody. I hope that you found some useful uh, tips and ideas in there to help you get to spring. Um, I'd like to thank Bryce uh, for his candor and and honesty and transparency and and all of that. He's a great guy. He's quickly becoming one of my favorite people in the moving industry. Uh, So really appreciate him uh, coming on. Um, Once again, uh, thank you for listening. If, uh, if you have any questions or have any ideas for future shows, shoot us an email at moversresourceguide at gmail.com. Um, also, you know, please go ahead and click that subscribe button. Uh, uh, another reminder, if you're enjoying this here, uh, check us out on the uh, audio-only podcast channels. Wherever you listen to your podcast, we're there. Uh, appreciate you. Um, hope that helps. Now get moving. <laughs> <laughs>